Hello, I'm Laura Shavin and this is The Offcut Straw. Welcome to The Offcut Straw, the show that looks inside a writer's bottom drawer to find the bits of work they never finished, had rejected or couldn't quite find a home for. We bring them to life, hear the stories behind them and learn how these random pieces of creativity paved the way to subsequent success. My guest this week is the multi-award winning writer, journalist and broadcaster Jay Rayner. Although he's written columns and features on subjects across all aspects of modern life, he is probably best known for his pieces about food and drink, having been the Observer's restaurant critic for the past 20 years. On the airwaves, he's been the host of Radio 4's Kitchen Cabinet since 2012, and on television, his numerous appearances include being a judge in multiple series of MasterChef, being the resident food expert on BBC's The One Show, and in the US, he was a part of the expert panel on Top Chef Masters for Bravo. As a writer of books, he's published four novels and seven works of non-fiction, and his latest work, My Last Supper, has just come out in paperback. His book, A Greedy Man in a Hungry World, about the challenges of food security in the 21st century, became a one-man show which toured Britain for 18 months and resulted in him giving evidence to the House of Commons Select Committee on Food, the Environment and Rural Affairs. Add to that his many live shows playing jazz piano with the Jay Rayner Quartet, and you have a man who may possibly have been subject to puns on the phrase, if music be the food of love, one too many times. Jay Rayner, welcome to the Offcut Straw. Lovely to be here. I'm slightly exhausted by listening to that account of me. (laughs) Well, you shouldn't be so damn productive. That's your own fault. Has anybody actually used that phrase, if music be the food of love? I suspect they have. I mean, it's my own fault because when we started gigging as the Jay Rayner Quartet, one of the selling points was that, you know, people know me through food, so we'd do a whole bunch of songs that are food-related. Mm. So the original show was called A Night of Food and Agony. It might still be called that, actually. And so if there are any puns like that to be made, you know, I'm entirely responsible for them. Well, let's start with the basics. What do you need to have around you when you write? Well, the bluntest answer to that is because I have been a print journalist, you've alluded to the fact that I, I've written on almost everything. People know me as a writer who writes restaurant reviews and writes about food but I have covered literally everything apart from sport and even then I once wrote about the all amateur natural bodybuilding championships Um, (laughs) and one of the I'm going to say it's a skill one of the skills of the inveterate print journalist is I can write anywhere and I have done if you if you give me a device I can sit there and write in fact on occasion back in the old days when I was a hardcore news journalist I could actually dictate it off the top of my head I didn't do that very often it wasn't great So in in reality, I can write anywhere, but I'm talking to you today from my desk, which is the front upstairs room of the house in Brixton that I've lived in for over 20 years. Uh, It has a large desk. It has a it has all the stuff. I mean, Mm. it's just, you know, it's just a a, a bleeding office. What can I tell you? Okay, let's kick off with your first off cut. Can you tell us what it's called, what genre it was written for and when it was written? Um, this is an outtake from my latest book, My Last Supper, which is a piece of non-fiction about my pursuit of my last meal on Earth, and it was first published last year in 2019. I have seen only three dead bodies in my life, which strikes me as remarkable for a 50-something man. Everybody who has ever lived has also died, or will do so. It is, to paraphrase Benjamin Franklin, the only certainty in life along with taxes, and you can dodge the latter with the help of a devious accountant. Nobody can help you dodge death, not even a devious doctor. And yet, just three, two of whom belong to my parents. Death is the part of life we hide from. The other body belonged to a middle-aged man with a luxurious moustache. He was staying at the same hotel as my family in southern Portugal in the late 70s. He was a weak swimmer. After a good lunch, he went in the water, got out of his depth, panicked and had a heart attack. By the time I saw him, his body was out of the pool and was being worked on by two men pumping his chest. I would have been eleven or twelve, old enough to recognise the futility of what was going on down there. I remember looking down from one of the balconies that ringed the pool as a hot afternoon gave way to the long shadows of early evening and being struck by how different he didn't look. Take away the men trying to restart his heart and he was just a chap, asleep poolside. The fact that this was the body of a dead man was more a concept than anything tangible. With my mother, it was obvious. Claire had taken her time about dying. 
It was an emergency operation on her bowel that had put her in hospital and from which she never recovered, slipping between intensive care, isolation rooms, and, for a short period, her bedroom at home. One day, to cheer her up, I called up Scott's in Mayfair, one of London's great seafood restaurants and a place she loved. Scott's did not do takeaways, but I asked if they might make an exception both for me and, more importantly, my old mum. The life of a restaurant critic is, of course, one long line of perks. This surely had to be another. So it proved. They put freshly cooked blinis, a tiny glass bowl of chopped shallots, and another of crumbled egg yolk onto a Scots-branded plate, and then added to the side a small tin of caviar. The whole plate was wrapped up in cling film to keep everything in place for the journey to North London. Well, this book's already published. So what happened to this section? Why didn't it make the final cut? I, I don't think it made the final cut because it was just a bit gloomy, actually. I, I think I felt it was performative in, in me going on about death. Um, now, obviously, both my parents have died. And at times, I have written pieces for The Observer, the newspaper for which I write, on both of them. A long piece for my mother, because Claire Rayner was well-known and, you know, a prominent figure, mm. and they got me to write sort of 3,000 words when she died. And I wrote a smaller piece on my father around food. And people always congratulate you when you write movingly about the death of a parent. And my view is that if you cannot write well about that subject, you have no business being a writer because the material is so strong, frankly. That sounds kind of cynical and all of that. And I think after writing this passage, I looked at it and felt I'd done it to death, uh, literally, figuratively, enough already with the dead parents. The death of my mother appeared in a previous book. It was just too much. I mean, it, you know, listening to it, I have to say, yeah, nice piece of writing. Uh, mm. the, the prose is all there. It, it's almost, dare I say, you know, it's it, it's involving. But just because something sounds nice doesn't mean it has a place in the narrative. And so it needed to be cut. But the book itself is called My Last Supper. The implication of the title is it's about death. So if it doesn't involve the death of your parents, can you tell us what it does involve? Yeah, death well, of? it doesn't involve the death of me either. So the opening, it makes the point, you, you, you've mentioned that I do live shows. And the first one, A Greedy Man in a Hungry World, led, led to others. One around terrible restaurant experiences called My Dining Hell. And another one called The Ten Food Commandments, which I play a kind of culinary Moses. And I'd always have a question and answer session. And so always, literally, I mean, well, I'd go 95% of the time. When we get to the question and answer, someone put their hand up and say, imagine you're on death row, what would your last meal be? And I, I became intrigued by the question because I thought if I, I'd always say if I was on death row, I'd have lost my appetite. <laughs> and that actually that's not what you're being asked. What you're being asked is if you were to prepare a meal that was the sum of all your parts, that represented you and all your appetites and your urges and your passions, what would you have? And that I thought was very interesting. So it, it is memoir. It's about looking at those foods that talk to me through through memoir and obviously at the end of it I'm still alive I mean death is around in it slightly particularly in the intro when I talk about all those various proper candidates for one who mm. are the people least suited to eating it but actually I have to say I was doing this show uh, the show that's around this one my last supper right up to the point of lockdown and the idea of doing a show about last meals on earth in the, in the teeth of a you know murderous <laughs> pandemic it's it's not really a brilliant sales job is it I've already done it uh, at a drive-in so yeah I, I it's it's actually I hope an uplifting journey through life and food and memory and emotion and family and all of that stuff which again is, is probably another reason why I decided to cut this just didn't think it needed to be there now you've covered all sorts of different subjects in your journalistic career why or how uh, did you end up specializing in food and drink um why did I accept the job of going out to restaurants on somebody else's expenses and Oh, it was you know, offered to you. You didn't. I mean, that, that's the honest answer. So I went out to lunch with the editor of the Observer magazine in 1999. And she said that the then restaurant critic, Kate Flett, was moving on to be the TV critic, which meant they had a vacancy. And literally in that instance, they said, well, that's a job you can't apply for, but I'd like to do it. I had this vision, you know, could you imagine one of those, in the old days, media ads would turn up in The Guardian on Mondays and wanted restaurant critic. Could you imagine the pile of applications? You wouldn't actually, <laughs> you know, you wouldn't ask for applications. I just put my hand up and said, I'd like to do it. 
you you've known me a long time Laura I, I've always been a, a chunky chap I like my lunch I like my dinner uh, I'm part of a noisy northwest London Jewish family who communicated through food I spent my own money in restaurants and I thought here's something I could write about I didn't anticipate just what a good fit it would be or what a lucky time it would be to go into the job because it was the beginning of a major restaurant boom but I also found in the subject so much more than just aesthetics it's not about how things taste it's you know about emotions and who we are and the brilliant thing about a good restaurant is it stops the world and places you somewhere else so yeah and that was it I, I didn't intend to go on for 20 years you know various times I said I should quit and get back to serious journalism but well, that hasn't happened. It is serious journalism, isn't it? Well, it, actually, in my case, I, I shouldn't be so dismissed myself because I still remain a reporter. And certainly through lockdown, I was doing an awful lot of proper old-fashioned reporting. I've been on that paper, The Observer, for 24 years, and they have long memories. And they know that they can send me out with a notebook and tell me to go and do some news stories. Mm. Um, so I have been doing a lot of stuff around uh, coronavirus and its impact on various elements of society. So yeah, you're right, I'm still doing serious journalism and then I'm writing restaurant reviews, which I hope are entertaining. Well, the lack of mortgage, presumably, is, is a good indication that it is. Oh, no, my parents died left me a legacy. Let's not pretend. You know, that's how it happens. <laughs> Check my privilege. I just have. I've got loads of it. <laughs> OK, time for another off-cut now. Tell us about this one. Uh, this is a clip from Bluff, um, an unfinished novel I was working on around 1998. Danny Sachs didn't plan to be a hitman. As a child... Before poker, long before handguns, he had imagined other lives, as the person on the television who told everybody the weather he'd chosen for the next day, or the man outside their house with the broom and the trolley who kept the streets neat and tidy in autumn. He liked neat and tidy. None of his thoughts turned to killing. It was not what nice Jewish boys from the London suburbs did. It was not even what the nasty Jewish boys from the London suburbs did. They became accountants or quantity surveyors or, if they had truly gone to the bad, chiropodists, destined to measure out their lives in sliced verrucas and corns. Even they did not become murderers. When he was little, his mother also had dreams for her son, but they were fantasies, based more on unrealised ambitions for herself than for him. She had wanted a life of Persian rugs two inches thick, of Wedgwood crockery and silver cutlery. Instead, she lived with carpet tiles and lino, willow pattern and stainless steel. She looked to her son to provide that which she had never obtained. Sylvia Sachs imagined newspaper announcements of her Daniel's achievements, of his victories over death in the operating theatre. She imagined glowing descriptions of his supple cross-examinations in the High Court. Each would include the passing reference she craved. It was so vivid she could even visualise the serif typography, the drop of the comma after her boy's name, and then her own immortalisation. Mr Daniel Sachs, son of Sylvia and Bernard Sachs of Kingsbury, triumphed yesterday. This was all she now wanted, to live her life as a subclause. That's a really lovely little piece, that, actually. <laughs> isn't it? Isn't yeah. it? So should but, we have a, a moment's mourning while I explain what, what oh Bluff no. was? I'm rather hoping there's good news, but OK, tell us about the novel. All Bluff. right, so I need to go back here. I published my first novel, a novel called The Marble Kiss, in 1994, when mm -hmm. I was in my late 20s, and it was a, a, a somewhat complex art history romance thriller set in the present day in the 15th century because that's what you write when you're 26 and and it, it was nicely received didn't you know break any bestseller lists or anything we got shortlisted for a good award and all of that I then had a, a problem with the second one which we'll come to at which point an agent said to me what do you really want to write about and it was an interesting question because I realized I'd written by that point two novels that I'd never have gone into a shop and bought and this dawning realisation that I was writing stuff I myself wouldn't buy mm. was very, very important. And out of that came a novel called Day of Atonement, um, a big hulking lump of Judaica, which took my very secular family by surprise. 
it was the story of uh, two chaps, Mal Jones and... Oh, I've forgotten the name of my characters. Anyway, two <laughs> two chaps who meet down the side of what is quite uh, clearly Stonegrove Synagogue in Edgeware. Yeah. Um, one, Rosh Hashanah, uh, sneaked around the side for a fag. One has a machine for taking the fat off chicken soup. The other one has a business mind, and they go into business. And it tells the story of their life from sort of the late 60s to the 90s. And it's it's really, it's really the portrait of a friendship. And it is really quite Jewish. And it worked very, very nicely. I'm very proud of that book because I wrote it when I was very young and it's got a real emotional heart in it. And I needed to come up with a follow-up to that. Right. And that follow-up was this book that we've just heard a section from called Bluff. Now, Bluff was kind of a good idea and maybe a terrible one. I wrote 50,000 words of it, and the truth is that no publisher wanted to publish it, which suggested it wasn't necessarily as good an idea as I thought it was. But it was about a guy called Danny Sachs, who was terrible at poker, continued to play poker, but in another life was brilliant at bluffing because he was a hitman who never killed anyone. He managed to convince his victims to let him remove their identities from the world. It was a, a sort of caper, really. Yeah, yeah. And I liked the idea of a Jewish hitman with all his neuroses. I'd found that voice in Day of Atonement quite successfully. Mm -hmm. And I liked it again for this. And at the heart of it was what happens to a fake hitman when someone is sent to kill him. It was, it was kind of a romp. Yeah. Um, that was the idea. It was going to be a romp. It was going to be one eye on the gallery. It was a lot of comedy. And I think you can sense that in the passage you just heard. But as I say, no publisher wanted it. And this sort of gets to the meat of, I suppose, what your podcast is, the Offcuts Draw. How do we feel about that after, you know, the amount of work it takes? It takes a lot of work to write 50,000 words of a novel. Mm. And it was painful at the time. It is never anything but painful. But you kind of have to accept, I think that if 15 publishers have passed, you're not necessarily robbing the culture of something that needed to be there. And so, you know, it was hard, but I kind of accepted it. Mm. I, it's certainly not one of those projects that I've gone back to over the years thinking, mm, I really should revive that. Well, very sanguine of you, I must admit. I, well, you know, I was thinking about this when you asked me if, if I'd do this. And the truth is, although I'm, you know, quite a neurotic in certain ways... I am quite sanguine about this stuff. You write and you write and you write, and writing doesn't exist unless somebody's read it. And you cannot protest that everybody's missed the point if everybody's saying no. And that's not to say that maybe some people might have enjoyed Bluff if it had ever been completed and, and read, but nobody has a right to be published. And I know this drives certain writers who are finding it tough to get published, absolutely not, but you don't. You have to make an argument for yourself on the page, sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph. And if, you know, a lot of publishers look at it and go, no, I mean, obviously, there are, there are all the stories of books that were turned down time and time again and then went on to be great classics. But on the, in the main, I think you have to take it on the chin. OK, time for your next off cut. Can you tell us what this is, please? Right, well, this is actually from a piece of journalism written in 2003. It's from a newspaper feature that never got published about a drag queen called Lady Ding. Lady Ding couldn't be at the Welsh lesbian and gay Mardi Gras in Cardiff this year, but she still managed to stop the show. For ten minutes on that last Saturday in August, the screen at the side of the stage was filled with video footage of her act, all golden lacquered hair and massive shoulder pads and crooked grin. There was no audio, but they smothered the silence with Nobody Does It Like Me, sung by Martine McCutcheon. Lady Ding would have liked that, her friend said. When it came to singing, she would always find the wrong way to do it. That was part of the act, the forgotten words and the lousy voice and the scowl at the indignity of it all. When the video had finished and the music had faded, the crowd of 35,000 cheered. Gold balloons held by Ding's family and friends in the crowd were released to float away on the afternoon breeze and Cardiff's gay community said a last goodbye to one of the greatest drag queens the city had ever seen. Three weeks earlier, the body of Jason Massier, the man who created and performed Lady Ding, had been found floating in reeds at the edge of Panavan Pond near his home village of Markham, high up in the valleys. He was 32 years old. The death of someone so young is always a tragedy, but anyone talking to Lady Ding's fans over the past few weeks would have understood something deeper too. A sense of an opportunity that had been stolen from them. 
of the chance that they had lost to enjoy the success which should have been hers. She was one of the most talented drag queens I've ever seen, said Chris Marshall, who's managed gay bars all over Britain and now runs Cardiff's King's Cross pub where she performed so often. Not just one of the most talented in Cardiff, but anywhere. Kerry Dupree, the Welsh drag queen who has already made it onto the national stage and knows what it takes to get there, agrees. Jason had created a real character. He'd thought about it. He wasn't just a puff in a frock. There's too much of that in drag today. Jason had something. So who was this written for? So this was written for The Observer and was a, a classic example of, if I made my name anywhere in journalism before writing restaurant reviews, of the sort of work I did, which was a long-form feature where you, you take a small news story that you found in the in-briefs, you know, perhaps in the Western Mail or whatever, in this case, you know, a Cardiff newspaper, and you say, well, there's something bigger in this, there's a bigger story. So I spent uh, maybe, I think, three days in Cardiff on the ground to research this and it's as it says, it's the story of this chap who performed as a drag queen called Lady Ding, suffered from depression and killed himself. And it was clear that he was much more than just another drag queen on the scene um, mm. because the whole of the Cardiff Lesbian Gay Pride stopped that year to celebrate him. And I went to Cardiff and I spoke to his friends and I went to the bars that he would performed at. And I even went high up into the valleys where he'd been born, had fascinating conversations. Because I don't know about you, but I, I'd, at that point, this is 2003, so we're, we're going back, you know, nearly 20 years. I'd assumed the valleys to be very conservative places. And there was this intriguing line where it said, nobody cares up here whether you're gay or you're straight. Life is on a knife edge. It's a struggle. And, you know, who you're having sex with is of no interest to anybody at all. I thought it was absolutely fascinating. So it was about taking a small story and turning it, giving it its due giving it its its space to breathe and i did a lot of these 3 to 5000 word features where you're you're trying to breathe real life into into a story and the reality is i included this because i would say 98% of my journalism possibly more uh, gets into print not always the way back in my freelance career would you know when i was right at the beginning i'd lose a few pieces along the way it wouldn't make it would be spiked but this is one of the very rare big features that, for whatever reason never made it into the features well of the observer magazine do you were, know why well, I, it's it's a funny old thing the features well you know, you're, the editors of magazines are trying to create a gallery. Even now in the age of online, they're trying to, they, they have to think in terms of the object, the printed object in their hands, and then whatever else happens, it goes online. And it's always about getting the mix right. And I think week by week, this story never found its place in the well. And, you know, until eventually, after about nine months, we all had to put our hands up and go, well, it's dead, isn't it? Because, you know, journalism ages. Mm. Um, they were apologetic but not vastly apologetic because that is newspapers there are times when things don't make it into print you go off you write and you get paid for it and it doesn't happen but i think weirdly this one has always stung slightly more than some of the bigger projects that we're talking about today Hi, this is Laura. Sorry to interrupt, but if you're enjoying the show, please do subscribe to the Offcut Straw. Give us a five star rating, leave a review, tell your friends about it. All that stuff's really important for a podcast like this. And visit offcutstraw.com for more details about the writers and actors and to find out about future live shows. Thanks for your support. Now back to the interview. As that article shows, you do cover a lot of subjects, and you're writing about mental health issues. You got your nomination for a Mental Health Media Award. Was this sort of part of it, because the suicide element? So with those awards, sometimes you have to look at an accident of how many pieces you happen to have written in any one year. And the, this really was about a, a person's story rather than the mental health issues, although obviously they played a part. But I think in one particular year, I'd written about mental health issues inside Holloway Prison. Mm -hmm. I'd written another piece about a change in government policy on access to medication and permissions and so forth. And that's the way of being a, you know, a jobbing journalist. You can end up with little specialisms and then suddenly you seem to be the guy who's, you know, heading off 
to to Whitemore Prison to interview someone. So um, just happenstance. But no, with this one, I think it really was about a personality, about an individual, and about a milieu drag. You know, we're we're all across drag now, we, thanks to RuPaul and so forth. We think we know what that is. But back in two thousand and three, it would have been very much more niche. Next off cut, please. What's this one? This is the opening to The Memory Man, a completely finished and unpublished novel written in around 1995. Here is a lad sitting in the long grass, arse damp, knees muddy. He tries to hold his breath, one hand squeezing his tummy as though grabbing the air in the palm of his hand to keep it there. He doesn't want to make a noise, doesn't want to frighten the animal any more than necessary. When he does breathe, he can hear a growling inside his nostrils, the cavities wet and stuffed up from the sobs of a few minutes before. Here then am I, nine years old, bottom lip bitten between teeth, the only witness to the killing of a friend. In the field twenty feet in front of me, the animal lies flat, a gulping, snorting carcass in waiting, neck tensed, its spindle-thin legs splayed hard before it, the broken one at the back turned away, useless. Papa has the gun, the rifle butt wedged into his armpit like a crutch. He tries to position the end of the barrel just behind the animal's eye. That's where it has to be, he says, to be quick. He wants to do it with one bullet. Why pay for two when you can do it with one? Bullets cost money, he says. So do goats, I think, but I don't say it out loud. He doesn't want to know how much goats cost. A pistol would be better, something small and hand-sized instead of this tree-trunk lump of wood and metal which keeps slipping off her fur and bearing its steel snout in the earth. Each time he has to lift the barrel up and clean the mud out of the hole, sticking his little finger up there in the way he does when he's digging around in his ears for wax. And when he does it, taking his hand off her shoulder to turn the weapon around in his hands, she flaps and twitches in the grass, like some big fat cod dumped on a quayside. I wanted to help hold her, just so she knew I was there, one hand on her side where you can feel the ribs and the deep thump of her heart. But Papa wouldn't have it. I had to be back here, watching. Now the gun is clean again. He gets down on one knee, uses the other to guide the barrel into place, closes an eye as though taking aim, even though he can't miss. I want to tell him that he's hurting her by pushing the gun down so hard, but I know it's just because he doesn't want it to slip off again. And anyway, I don't want to stop him. I just want him to do it now. And then there's a bang and some smoke. And Papa shouts shit and falls backwards and she twitches one last time. A puddle of thick black goo dribbles out of her head onto the grass. Beatrice is dead. I think about crying, but I don't feel like it anymore. Was this written before your first published novel? No, this? that's the hilarious thing. Uh, most people's unpublished novel is their first, is the first one they write. This is my second, so um, <laughs> which is quite funny. So I, well, at the time I thought I'd struck lucky in uh, ninety two. Ninety two was a big year for me. I won Young Journalist of the Year in the British Press Awards, and publishers started showing interest in me and. They said, do you want to write a novel? Because, you know, anybody who had a byline in a newspaper, they immediately thought you wanted to write a novel. And at first I'd said no. And then I came up with a couple of chapters of something which became my first novel, The Marble Kiss, that art history romance thriller. And it was bought by Pam McMillan in a two-book deal, get me, um, <laughs> for, for a modest two-book deal. And The Marble Kiss did, as I say, all right. It got some nice appreciative reviews. It got shortlisted for an award, but it didn't you know sell very many but then I had to write the next one under the two book deal and one summer my wife and I Pat and I had gone off we, still without kids we'd gone off to the south of France one summer and there was a traveling circus and it was clearly a family circus and you know the the, the circus it was tiny and the circus animals were goats <laughs> um, and they were much loved goats because clearly they were source of milk as well as performers and the clown was the 10 year old kid who frankly looked a bit miserable to be doing this again and I sat there watching this thinking oh there must be a novel in telling this story you're meant to be in the circus meant to be exciting but actually you're bored and you're miserable and you don't want to be here from the point of view of a 10 year old now at that point <laughs> I then in I don't want to be down on myself as a young man, but it all got a bit baroque. 
Um, so the story, and actually, that's, I have to say, I do think there is quality to this book, The Memory Man. It's about a kid who is part of a circus traveling through Vichy, France during the Second World War. And something happens. He gets drawn in to resistance work and stuff to do with uh, French Jews being rounded up and sent to concentration camps. Cut to the present day. It was a time slip. And there's a very, very old man who's being brought to trial as the as a, a, a Nazi war criminal in France. And he has gone and acquired for himself a lawyer. And the lawyer is actually the kid who was in the circus. Is that um, the big reveal? Or, or, it's sort or... of the big reveal. And he's the child who ran away from the circus to be boring. He wanted to be a lawyer. He wanted to be dull. Right. And he gets drawn back into the history of his childhood and the Holocaust in France. It's not, not unambitious. Um, <laughs> and it's about memory and memory acts and all of that. And what happened, you know, I completed this book and I'd been through many editors at Pan Macmillan. Eventually, the boss of Pan Macmillan would apologise to me for this. I went through five editors between Ooh. signing that two book deal and then finally parting company with them. They said that they had decided to cancel something like 20 book contracts where the advances were 10 grand or less, which included mine. And so they cancelled the contract. And I got paid my whacking four-figure sum and then it went out you know, my then agent sent it around and nobody wanted to publish it what can I tell you Laura nobody nobody wanted it that was hard that was very very hard but it was also the beginning of an understanding as I say I'm, it's an interesting book and every now and then I look at it and think maybe there's a way to get this published but um at one point I had an absolutely appalling idea should I confess my appalling absolutely, idea absolutely yes all right well, because I didn't do it so it's fine <laughs> but I I had this idea what would happen if I resubmitted this under the pseudonym what should we call it Danielle Schwartz or something a young Jewish woman who is the granddaughter of holocaust survivors and then see what would happen <laughs> But well, surely, as, as a North London Jew, you must have some Holocaust survivory stuff in your past. Oh, yeah, we've all got a bit of that. But, yeah. um, <laughs> exactly. but I don't think that's how I was known. But anyway, there's a whole book. And interesting, my, my dear old Ma, who wrote about 50 novels herself, always said that that was the one that she felt had got away. But I made it almost a point of principle. I am a grown up writer. I will let it go. And I did let it go. Right, we're time for another off cut now. What have we got? Right. Now, this only sort of fits into the title Off Cuts, if you're being very pessimistic, but we'll let it sit there. It's from a theatre play, the first draft of which I wrote in 2010, the most recent draft I wrote in 2019. It's called The Devil's Interval. My dad was the classic scholarship boy, first person from his lot to go to grammar school, so exams were a big thing. If he passed them, it meant he was supposed to be there. Became addicted. Got him into some college to do business studies, all of that. Swear he became an accountant just because of all the exams there were. Play quietly, love. Your dad's studying. He was always studying. If you've got certificates, no one can ever argue. Ferg begins to play a classical medley. But, Dad, there's got to be more to all this than just passing Grade 7. Of course, lad, plenty more. It's called Grade 8. At the back, a light piece of cocktail bar piano jazz starts up. Ferg stands to address the audience. You remember I told Sam I'd never made it to grade 8? Funny story. A week before my grade 8 exam, I hiked my guts out across Dartmoor as part of this Duke of Edinburgh Gold Award thing I was on. Right at the end, just as I was about to finish the job, I was given this signed chit to prove I'd done the task. Now, for my dad, pieces of paper were like pages from the Holy Bloody Bible. I had to take it back to show Dad, or he simply wouldn't believe I'd done it. So, I'm holding on to this piece of paper for dear life. Stumbling down off the moor like I'm six pints down at closing time. I'm that knackered. And I'm on this path by a stream. Of course there's a sudden gust of wind, isn't there? And bang, the paper's out of my hand. There it is in the stream. I dive at it like I'm rugby tackling the piece of paper because I have to show it to Dad. Have to. Hit the deck with massive force. Throw my hand into the water to break my fall and I smash it against a rock. So hard I know it's broken. No question. Actually, it's not a very funny story, is it? He gets to his feet, 
walks to the piano and slams his fists against the keyboard, bringing the music to a halt. My sodding old man! Tell us the story of the Devil's Interval from 2010 uh, to today. Right, so um, around 2009... 2010, I started doing an awful lot of TV work. Somewhere along the line, Laura, I gathered a bit of work and became, I don't know, well-known. I was bloody busy and it, I felt like I didn't own myself anymore and I wanted something that was mine. I needed to write something that was mine. I have, um, as you mentioned, I play jazz piano and I have done for a very long time and I'd done a, a jazz piano night class at Goldsmiths a few years before, but I'd been intrigued by the dynamic in the room, the way... You know, at night classes, people bring their stories in with them. And I saw a piece of theatre in this. And that's what The Devil's Interval is. It's a story of a jazz piano night class, five students, one teacher, three pianos. And the key is every single actor on that stage plays, which creates some issues, it has to be said. But that was the idea. And each of the students has a moment when they come forward and tells their story. Imagine it as a kind of jazz solo. There's also a, an overarching narrative to this. I worked on it with a dear friend of mine, Joe Thompson, who's a, another jazz pianist, a very, very fine jazz pianist. And it has gone through six drafts, which is not that unusual in theatre, it has to be said. I mean, you, you know, you have a history in theatre too, and you know that. The Devil's Interval, by the way, is the sharpened fourth or the flattened fifth. The, uh, the Roman Catholic Church regarded it as evil, and it's one of the key tones in jazz, which is marvellous. And at various times, it has come very close to being produced. We had a slot at the Watford Palace, which is a great, you know, just outside London theatre. Yes, a lovely theatre. Um, and they were ready to produce it, but we needed extra money to be able to take it into town. And we needed the right cast to be able to take it into town. We've had some very good names attached to it over the years. Mm -hmm. Then another director came on. He was very keen and he was going to take it to another place and another director. And, the, and it's, you know, it's a classic story. And it was revived again, which is why I did the sixth draft in 2019. It's gone through various versions, long, short, such is the way of things. I still think it's a, a real goer. <laughs> I mean, this is not, I think we know, this is not the moment in which to be trying to get pieces of theatre on stage. But I wrote it because I wanted to sit in the theatre and watch it. And the idea, the way the music plays, the way you actually watch the actors, the musicians compose in real time that was the idea sorry they have to not only play the piano and act but they have to compose well the idea was that as we get deeper into it they would start properly improvising we, we'd worked out a boot camp for them i mean obviously every single one of the actors had to have a history with jazz or at least piano i mean they didn't have to be jazz pianists they just uh, had to play jazz pianists but we reckoned between us we could get them there it's it's it's, it's a very ambitious piece <laughs> But I'll not, say. yeah. But not in terms of you know theatre. I was very careful to make sure it was one set, yeah. and and the asset three pianos. Well, you know, look after them, and you can flog them off again afterwards. I I had yeah. many conversations with producers over the years saying, and the great thing is, you can sell the pianos on. Early on, I was asked if I would sit on a panel at the National Theatre to talk about Arnold Wesker's The Kitchen. So you can imagine that, you know, Rayner, the restaurant critic, the Observer, would have quite a good view on Wesker's The Kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I agreed to do it. And they said, there's a stipend, there's a, a fee, 150 quid. And I said, I'll waive my fee, but I'll trade you a moment sitting on a panel on stage for a coffee with Sebastian Bourne, the literary manager of the National Theatre. And they agreed. <laughs> so... I took Bashbourne out, people probably don't know the name, but he was in his time the literary gatekeeper at the National. And I took him out for coffee and described this play. And actually, in a moment of, I think, great control, I didn't do this until we were on the third draft. And I described what the idea was. And he said, so you think you're writing this? And then I did the thing which must make any literary manager's blood run cold. I went, no, here it is, and pushed the script across the table to him. Bash was very, very supportive. He said, it's not right for the National, but I really think this has got something. And he put us in touch with endless producers. And so it goes. Over the years, it's gone through lots of offices and never quite made it. And that's why I say I might be cheating in putting it in the offcuts drawer because I'm not quite ready to say that that's gone. Well, at the moment it is an offcut. At the time of broadcast, it will be an offcut. But who knows? Maybe as a direct result of being on the offcut draw, <laughs> it ceases to be one, which would be well, marvelous. Well, you know, I, I, I can happily send it. I have it in PDF and Word format. 
and I think it would be a great night in theatre, and that's why I wrote it. All right, then, time for your final offcut now. Uh, this is an outtake from my novel The Apologist, brackets, probably my most successful novel, which was published in 2004. One night, desperate for someone, well, damn it, anyone, to accept my apology, I returned alone to the bar where I had met Mandy and Tracy. I had it all worked out. I would identify the most attractive single woman in the room. I would approach her hesitantly, tell her she looked terribly familiar. Were you, by any chance, part of the French delegation at the African Union Congress in Kinshasa? You weren't? Gosh, that's weird. You really are the spitting image of a Parisian woman I met there. My prey, of course, would recognise me and be bowled over by my glossy pattern of celebrity and power. She would ask me to breathe hotly in her ear. Breathing hotly was my new party trick. With these introductions made, all I had to do was slip into bed with her and then treat her terribly badly the next morning. I had no doubt that my newfound sleekness and confidence would enable me to do this. What woman could resist such an approach with its heady mixture of African exotica and French sophistication? All of them, as it happened. The first one said, Nice try, kiddo, but you're playing a little out of your league, don't you think? The second one said, Excuse me, sir, but just my own reference, where exactly on my face is the word schmuck tattooed? Which was better than the response from the third woman. She didn't say anything. She just laughed at me, grabbed her bag and her coat and ran from the bar, still hooting to herself as she clacked her way down the street on vertiginous heels. Oh, another lovely little piece there. Really like that. <laughs> Why was this not included in the book? Um, because a, a little bit like the very first except we heard, it was over-egging the pudding. I'd, I'd already done this gag in a number of ways. So to explain, The Apologist began, I was watching an episode of Friends and it was the one where Monica admits that she'd once been fat and Chandler admits that he once finished with a girl because she got fat and Monica makes him go and apologise and he apologises and he comes back and he says, gee, if I'd known how good apologising made me feel, I'd have started doing it years ago. And I turned to my long-suffering partner who was used to me saying this and said, there's a novel in that, someone who apologises because they like it, how it makes them feel. So The Apologist is about a restaurant critic, yay, called Mark Bassett, <laughs> who is renowned for his very negative reviews until one of the chefs he reviews apparently commits suicide as a result of the review. So he goes off and he apologises to the widow. And it's an all-round positive experience. And he feels brilliant about himself as a result of that apology. And he decides to apologise for everything he's ever done wrong. Um, just because he likes the emotional roller coaster, so you get an insight into his life because he goes around apologising to everybody. The the kid he was horrible to, in you know, when he was eight years old, the girlfriend he did wrong, all of that, and eventually a video of him apologising to one particular friend goes viral and becomes so successful that he is appointed chief apologist to the United Nations to travel the world apologising for the sins of colonialism, slavery. It invented this concept of penitential engagement, a whole academic discipline, and captured a moment. And it is a broad political satire with a heart, dare I say it, um, <laughs> and is without doubt the most successful book I've ever written. It was translated into over a dozen languages. At one point, Brad Pitt was going to produce the film version of it. I even sold a website for ridiculous sums of money. I mean, it was a whole roller coaster. The bit that we've just heard, he digs into his role as chief apologist to the United Nations and finds that it's not quite emotionally satisfying enough apologising in a political environment, so he needs to go back and create some uh, crimes for which he can apologise on a personal level. And so he's wandering around trying to trip people up and apologise to them. I um, see. Because when I read that, when we heard that clip, and he says, all I have to do is treat her abysmally the next morning, I think he obviously I've missed a bit about that's how you get a girl. You've got to be mean to her. No, 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 no. He just wrong. wanted something to apologise for. And oh. because he's now an international political celebrity... He's getting some, you know. He's he he used never to have any luck in bed, but now he's sexy and you know and fancy, and everybody wants him. Yeah. Um. And so he thinks he's really it. It is a classic first person uh, narrator novel in that it's all about the unreliable narrator who is not quite clocking what's going on around him. Yeah. And this bit will have come out because it was over egging the pudding, and perhaps because it may have made you think just a little too poorly of Mark Bassett, the chief apologist to the United Nations. And the character Mark Bassett, the restaurant critic. Yeah. Was, <laughs> Go on. Is he you? Or? He was significantly me in certain ways. I mean, not because 
his personal story he doesn't have my parentage or whatever but certain of my body issues and stuff from when I was a kid I'd certainly mind my own life for that to create the, the bundle of insecurities yeah I threw I, I threw more of myself into that book than I did any other right final question are there any off cuts that you've still got that you haven't shared with us today um that's a, that is an interesting question I don't think there are I mean, I have been, some people might think that one and a half novels and a whole play that's been through six drafts, and the other bits are sort of smaller and tangential, is quite a lot to have in the offcuts drawer. In a writing career of over 30 years, I don't think it is, actually. I think I've been either very fortunate or just blessed with huge, unending reserves of talent. Um <laughs> If you so, yourself. <laughs> one, one or the other, one or the other. The, you know, I haven't lost that much along the way. Yeah. There's quite a lot of studio-based TV proposals right. that have never seen the light of day. Probably a, at least a dozen of those, but we've yeah. all got those. Yes, we have. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't think they really count. So I genuinely think I'm quite fortunate. That said, you know, the, there's, what, 150, uh, 200,000 words of unpublished stuff yep. but then to put that in context I probably write anywhere between 100 and 200,000 words a year so okay. it's livable and as for the memory man that we heard earlier have yeah. you thought about repurposing it could you maybe turn it into a radio play or a film script I've occasionally toyed with that but my appetite for going back to something that I wrote well over 20 years ago is limited if I'm honest I'd much rather just move on. I, I genuinely don't think that, that I have deprived the culture of anything. Right. Most books, however grand and great we think they are, move down the river, don't they? They just pass us by and we read them and we enjoy them at the time, however successful they are. The apologist has a life beyond itself. But for the most part, what we write is just part of the culture that passes by. So I, I don't look at the memory, I don't look at Bluff and think, oh, that's a waste. I, well, I think it's more important just to keep going, moving forward. I suppose forward. you have got a sufficient body of work behind you to be able to go, look, I created all of this, and that was shared with the public successfully. So maybe you don't miss the memory man and bluff that much. If you, no, I don't. If you've only written one or two, you might go, oh, I'd like a bigger body for the amount of work I put in. Yeah, I don't think in those terms. I don't think, oh, I'm, you know... One of the hilarious things is that Claire, my late mother, um, she published over 100 books... And when you are faced by that body of work, don't even think about competing. Um, I'm, I was the one who was responsible for boxing them all up and putting them all into storage. I still have the, a copy of every single edition is in storage. And I remember boxing it all up and putting it in the, the lockup, the secure lockup, and stepping back from these big piles of cardboard boxes and thinking, and, and this is not to dismiss her body of work because Claire was, you know, did very important work, but thinking, just remind yourself, this is how it ends. <laughs> With, wow. you know, a dozen large cardboard boxes in a lockup. So we live our lives in the moment. And it's about enjoying the process of writing and being a writer rather than one eye on what you might not have completed. And on that profound note, I, I think we'll end it there. It's, it's been lovely to talk to you, Jay Rayner. Thank you for sharing the contents of your offcuts draw with us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. The Offcuts Draw was devised and presented by me, Laura Shavin, with special thanks to this week's guest, Jay Rayner. The Offcuts were performed by Keith Wickham, Christopher Kent, Toby Longworth and Rachel Atkins, and the music was by me. For more details about this episode, visit offcutsdraw.com and please do subscribe, rate and review us. Thanks for listening. Bye.